So I'd like to turn the floor to Professor Johan Rockström to give an overview of the report. Professor Rockström is director of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. He represents both Future Earth and Earth League. Over to you, Johan. Thanks, uh, Wendy, and good morning, everyone. So just, just to set the report again in stage, I mean, the, the purpose of this is from the scientific community to hand over the 10 new insights that we believe every climate negotiator must have in his or her back pocket to be an effective negotiator at any COP meeting and certainly here in Glasgow. So this is the, the scan of the latest insights. Insight number one is that from an Earth system science perspective, we land in the conclusion that 1.5 degrees Celsius is still a possible landing zone. We can still achieve it. The question is, how will we do that from a feasibility perspective? And that an overshoot is likely. It translates to a two gigaton, two billion tons of carbon dioxide per year reduction pace in a linear level, that's 5% per year. But if you want to have a two thirds chance of success, it requires a doubling to 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year, and we emit today 42 gigatons or billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. I think I'll run through the report, Patricia, if that's okay, and then we do it that way? Okay, so insight number so here you have the pathways in the report in terms of the landing zone to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Insight number two is what has been very much in discussion here in Glasgow, namely that there is no safe landing to deliver the Paris Agreement only by decarbonizing the global energy system carbon dioxide. Methane, nitrous oxide, the non-CO2 gases are worsening global warming. The climate models show clearly that we need to follow the same pace of reductions as carbon dioxide to have a chance of delivering the Paris Agreement. Here you see the latest assessments of the warming versus cooling, cooling gases and that nitrous oxide and methane are fundamental here and that the discussions here and agreements is one step along the way but not sufficient scientifically. Also important in this context is to remind ourselves that air pollutants are actually cooling the planet. So we have a paradox and a very dramatic one, which is that one environmental problem, air pollutants, are camouflaging another environmental crisis, the global warming crisis. And this is well established scientifically. Insight three is that we've entered the age of intensified mega fires. This is also causing, apart from social impacts on humans, enhanced climate positive feedbacks, which is a warming amplifier. And here you have the 2019-2020 mapping of the accelerated forest fire outbreaks, which are now covering more and more area and caused by human global warming or, or, or accentuated by human global warming. Tipping elements are real. It's a real risk that we cannot rule out. The IPCC is clear here. Here you see the trajectory in terms of the risk assessments from science from the third assessment of the IPCC all the way till today. What you see here is that the more uh, scientific advances, the lower in global mean temperature is the scientific assessment of the risk of crossing tipping points. And that the tipping point risk today is down between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius with low probability, high impact events. We don't have scientific certainty here yet but we are seeing more and more a risk landscape that is coming very closer within the Paris range. The scientific frontier here is that we are not only seeing the risk of crossing tipping points, but it's also that we are seeing the risk of interactions, so-called cascades between tipping element systems. And you see here, for example, when the Greenland ice sheet melts fast, releasing cold fresh water in the North Atlantic, slowing down the overturning of heat in the North Atlantic, impacting on the monsoon over the Amazon, which can explain higher degree of droughts and forest fires in the Amazon rainforest, which in turn also locks in warm water in the Southern Ocean, accelerating potentially the melting of the West Antarctic ice shelf. These cascades is on the scientific frontier we are still working very hard on this, but it just gives even stronger message to negotiators here that precaution is important. 
Climate action must be just, and this justice factor has very dramatic numbers. We know them all, but just to give you the latest statistics, the richest 1% must reduce emissions by a factor 30, while the poorest 50% in the world can actually increase emissions by a factor 3 for the world to stay within the global carbon budget in a fair way. Now, insight 6 is really on behavioral change. We need to have a transition not only into decarbonization of the energy systems in terms of technologies, but we also need 1.5 degrees Celsius lifestyles. Status quo in consumption patterns and growth will not take us to the Paris range. This is about equity, but it's also about lifestyle change and behavioral change. Insight 7 is about economic policy measures. We have so much scientific evidence today that carbon pricing can accelerate the scale of transition. 61 countries in the world have adopted a price on carbon. This is, however, it's only covering 22% of global emissions are covered by a carbon price, and so far the carbon price is not efficient because it's set at a too low level. But the European Union is the first example in the world of a region where the carbon pricing system is starting to work because it's starting to come up to scientific parity in the level of pricing at over 60 euros per tonne of carbon dioxide. Nature-based solutions are absolutely fundamental to have a chance of delivering the Paris Agreement. The challenge, though, is to have robust, resilient nature-based solutions and not to fool ourselves in investing in offsetting mechanisms that have already been factored into the climate models that give us a carbon budget. So, you know, the only reason why we have a remaining carbon budget that allows us to reduce emissions according to what I mentioned earlier of a net zero world economy by 2050 is that we assume that nature will continue to be a net carbon sink. So we need nature-based solutions, but we cannot use them to slow down the pace of emission reductions from fossil fuel emissions. The ocean is the resilient thermostat of the planet, biologically and physically. We have so much science today showing the threats to the ocean, and we'll come back to that in the discussion here. But this is something that will be also a determinant factor, and uh, investing in 30 percent targets for marine protected areas, we believe, is one measure to reduce these threats. And finally, number 10 is on the connections between climate impacts and costing, that we need to correct the market economic failure in factoring in the true cost of climate damage, and that the number one entry point there is really about health, that we have today over 7 million people per year being prematurely losing their lives because of air pollutants, which is one of the, the factors that we need to now fully factor into the costing of our uh, risky journey on climate change. So with that, a uh, rapid overview of the report, you have it on your chairs, and um, back to you, Wendy.